6, Counting the Cost Nimble-tongued and indignant Dame Burnett stood in the doorway talking to my mother. They have found it out now. They have found it out, declared our voluble neighbor. Who would suppose that for a year and a half those New Testaments could be passing from hand to hand secretly? And the Bishop of London, poor man, he having all his spies and informers hunting, and yet never find out till now how the books have been scattered. Such a trial as it must have been to the bishop. It's the Christian brethren that have been doing all the mischief. They have been sly, but they have been found out now. Farmers, peasants, tradesmen they are. Even some priests doing such a thing as helping the New Testament around the country. But it is well found out. Crowds of country folk are being dragged in now, put in prison, or sent before the bishop's court. The bishops will see that there are no more testaments handed around. It is terribly wicked to have a book like that in the house, sighed my mother, shaking her head as Dame Burnett paused for breath. Wicked? shrieked Dame Burnett. Why, all England seems to be going wicked. Someone was telling me that all Essex seems to have gone over to the New Testament. And in London, the books are for sale. But the people are getting scared. They will have to give up those books or go to prison or be burned. Something will happen now that the Bishop of London has found out what he wanted to know. My mother moved a little uneasily. She was much more kind-hearted than Dame Burnett. I hope the bishops will not have to burn anybody, my mother answered, hesitatingly. They ought to burn the New Testaments, of course, but... She was interrupted by a scornful laugh. Nothing is too bad for such folks, asserted Dame Burnett. I was in London seven years ago in 1521, when the heretics were punished there. Even when they recanted, there was a time. Many are the heretics I have seen made to go three times around the market on market day, stand on the highest step of the cross there for a quarter of an hour with a faggot of wood on their shoulder, and they had to go in the same way in a procession on Sunday, and they were branded with a red-hot iron on the cheek, and they must never in any way hide the mark. My mother shivered. Something had to be done, expostulated Dame Burnett, noting the effect of her words. Bishop Longland hunted up in that year nearly five hundred gospelers. They used to do such awful things, those gospelers. They would teach children Bible verses, and they would say the Ten Commandments, which I never knew and never will, and they said, What need is there to go to the feet when we may go to the head? Meaning the priests by the feet, mind you, and the Bible or some such thing by the head and they would carry their books from one man to another and read all night sometimes in a book, and some of them would eat on a fast day, and they would never go on any pilgrimage, for they said the true pilgrimage was to go barefoot and visit the poor and sick, and much good it would do anybody to have such visitors. My mother smiled. Dame Burnett was never herself so very welcome a visitor at our house, though my mother was ever kind and friendly. And, pursued Dame Burnett, those gospelers had pieces of the old Wycliffe English Bible that almost no one could read, and no one ought to, and they would not give the pieces up or worship the Virgin and the saints. But the gospelers said, Blessed be they that hear the word of God and keep it. Well, they got what they deserved. The bishop had the gospelers torn out of their houses and either burnt to death or else 
If they recanted, they had to wear the faggot badge for life. Benny is the one I had seen walking the street with the faggot badge on his clothes and the mark of the burn of the iron on his cheek. And if the wicked heretics now don't give up their New Testaments, we would like to see the same again. The women paid no attention to me. They did not know that there swept before me a vision of the man I had directed to neighbor Elt's hut. The man's cheek had a queer, dark mark. That was it, I thought. He must have been burned once on his cheek, because he was a gospeler. How it must have hurt. And he brought neighbor Elt the testament. My very heart was quaking within me. What did burning people to death mean? What would my mother say if she knew that father had a new testament? A priest found out about neighbor Alt's first testament. Could some priest find out about my father's testament, too? And my father was an Anabaptist. There are a good many of the butchers and tailors and carpenters among those Christian brethren who know they are suspected and they are trying to get out of England, declared Dame Burnett as she made ready to go. They are trying to hide in the holds of ships or else they are fixing themselves up so they think no one will know them. But they will not be a bit better off over in France or Belgium, for English folk can go over there and arrest them. Dame Burnett went away, but my spirits were made more dismal still by my aunt, Stephen's mother, who said she recollected that nine years ago, six men and a woman were burned at Coventry because they had taught their children and their servants the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments in English. Alas, I myself remembered enough of the New Testament to repeat under my breath sometimes the Lord's Prayer in English. It seemed so pleasant to say words that I could understand instead of praying in Latin. I was always terribly afraid, though, that to punish me the saints would make me forget the Latin words and my mother would find out and be shocked by my sudden ignorance. But I wondered that the saints and the virgin would not just as lief hear me pray in English as in Latin. Was Latin so holy a language? Or, perhaps, the saints did not understand English? People who taught their children the Lord's Prayer in English had been burned. Did that mean that my father would be? He was an Anabaptist, too. Was that worse? I was so frightened that I burst into tears, and my aunt vainly tried to comfort me, blaming herself meanwhile for having spoken such things. But I cried on and on till my mother, in alarm, declared that she believed I was ill. Oh, if I only dared tell my mother what ailed me. But I, I must never, never speak of the New Testament. What is the matter? queried my mother. And at last I sobbed. Oh, father! Father! <laughs> I am so afraid that something will happen to father. My mother laughed a little as she drew my head closely to her. Editha, Editha, she chided gently. Nothing will happen to father. Silly little lass. Dame Burnett must not talk about things before you any more. Did not think you would feel so, Editha. And my mother patted my cheek and kissed me, and then she went away and cut a piece of cheese and gave half to Stephen and half to me. This was a very great treat, and Stephen and I rejoiced over our dainty. But I could not be very merry, though I had cried away much of my terror. I resolved 
that I would beg my father that very night to dig a hole in the ground and hide the New Testament instead of keeping it where it might be found. I looked about for a good place to dig the hole. Let us go see the angel, proposed Stephen, who of course did not know of what I was thinking. I shook my head. You go, I answered. I was glad enough to have him take a fancy to visit our one-winged friend. When Stephen is gone, I will dig the hole and have it ready before Father comes, I determined. But Stephen refused to go without me, and he lingered near till I found that I could do nothing about the hole but select with my eye what I thought would be a good spot among some weeds near our house. I clenched my small fists at the idea of anyone daring to lay hold on my father and burn a great red place on his cheek because he had a New Testament. He shall have a New Testament if he wants it. I resolved angrily. Whatever he wants is right. And if, if they do burn his cheek, my courage was becoming faint again. If they do burn his cheek, I will always love him, always, no matter how ugly the burn makes him look. And I felt like crying again, only I diverted myself by thinking how I would hide my father's New Testament for him, and never tell, no matter what happened. Oh, I would be very wonderfully brave indeed. But I found no opportunity that evening to say anything to my father about my plan of the whole, and the next day something happened that I had hardly expected. It was Sunday. It had been my father's custom sometimes on Sundays to walk with me to some quiet place in the fields, and there read the New Testament, and there talk with me about what we read. And my father would there pray with me that the Lord Jesus might take away my sins. But this afternoon, my father stayed at home. My cousin Stephen was over at my aunt's house, of course, with his mother, and I slipped outdoors alone, leaving my father and my mother together. After a short time, I went into the house again, and I was surprised to see that my father was reading the New Testament. My mother was sitting not far off, and she was crying silently. I went to her and would have comforted her, but my father came too and put his arms around us both. We were very still, except that my mother sobbed once or twice. My father answered my inquiring look. Yes, Edith, he said softly. Mother knows about the New Testament. I told her last night, after you were asleep. I thought it was time that Mother knew. My mother knew, and my mother was afraid. Or else why did she cry so? But, oh, I was so glad that she knew. It had been so hard to have to keep a secret from one's own mother. Oh, Father! I burst forth. Do hide the New Testament in a hole. I will help you dig. My father looked at me. Edith, he replied, do not speak about the New Testament before Stephen or your aunt. We three, you and mother and I, may talk of it to one another all we please, quietly. Let us read to mother, you and I, Edith. And my mother, though apparently terrified at what she was doing, listened to me as I read somewhat stumblingly. And then my father read to us. His voice was calm and soothing. And my mother stopped crying and listened with a good deal of interest after a while. She even asked a few questions about what he read. At last, she asked, as one who had made up her mind to accept the worst, Are you going to be one of the Christian brethren? 
My father hesitated. I am one with them in loving the New Testament already, dear lass, he answered slowly. But there is another matter that neighbor Eld and I have talked of. If I do as I think this New Testament bids, I shall be more than one of the Christian brethren. My mother was silent, but she looked fixedly at him. He smiled tenderly, but his eyes filled with tears. I have read this New Testament from end to end, times over, he went on, and neither neighbor Eld nor I could find in it anything about praying to the saints, or about purgatory, or about praying for the dead. So I, I knew I must cut loose from the priests. My father stopped a moment, but my mother still said nothing. Neighbor Eld believed that he did not find something else in the New Testament, continued my father, and indeed I cannot find it there myself, and that is the way the priests do baptize us when we are babies, and bring us afterward into the church, and so there is first no change of heart in us, for the New Testament tells us plainly to repent and be baptized. And a neighbor eld said to me that a wee baby cannot repent, and that is true enough. The reason why neighbor eld was first thinking about that was this. When he was a boy, his grandfather lived in Oxford, and he used to tell him about some men and women that were whipped through Oxford streets years ago. There were about thirty of them, and they called themselves publicans, which was probably a corruption of the term Paulicians. They had come over to England from Gascony, and they had with them a pastor named Gerard. Henry the Second was king of England then, and he heard about these publicans that the priests were all against. But King Henry was so just, he would not let the poor people be punished without a hearing. And so there came together a council of popish bishops of Oxford to try these men and women. The pastor, Gerard, spoke for them. He told the bishops that he and his company were Christians, and that they held the doctrines of the apostles. But when the bishops asked more questions, it was found that the publicans did not believe in purgatory, or in prayers for the dead, or in praying to saints, or the baptism of babies, or in the changing of the bread and wine of the sacrament into the body and blood of Christ. The bishops tried to argue, but they could do nothing with their words, for the publicans would not admit anything contrary to the word of God. Though they were only poor peasants, the bishops were so angry that they reported to King Henry that the publicans were obstinate heretics, worthy of death. And King Henry was so influenced by the priests that he sentenced all the publicans to be branded with a red-hot iron on their foreheads as heretics, to be publicly whipped through the streets of Oxford, and afterward to be put to death, and nobody should show the publicans any kindness or comfort, for he who did would be punished. There was indignation in my mother's face, but still she said nothing. It was done this way, continued my father with a sigh. Their foreheads were burnt. The minister had a mark burnt on his chin, as well as his forehead. The publicans were driven out of the city with loud sounding stripes, and the hedges and the fields were covered with snow, as it was winter then. And the men and women, and children of the publicans, all died in the fields of cold and hunger, for no one showed them any kindness. My mother drew a long breath. It was cruel, she murmured. The publicans rejoiced as they went out to die, concluded my father in a low tone. The pastor, Gerard, 
went before them, singing some words that neighbor Eld found for me in the New Testament. They are, Blessed are ye, when all men shall hate you. There was a long pause. Oh, I wish, broke out my father vehemently, I wish the time might ever come when every man in England might worship God as he thought right. Freedom, freedom, that is what we want. Freedom to pray to God and worship him and read our New Testaments as he has commanded us. My father arose excitedly. He started to leave the house when my mother stopped him. You did not tell us, she reminded him, why it was you told us about the publicans. Was neighbor Eld one? Are you one? Her eyes looked at him as though she would read his soul. My father returned her gaze with equal solemnity. He knew what a heart wrench his words must give her. They are not called publicans now, he replied. They are called Anabaptists. Neighbor Eld was one. I am one in my belief, though I have never yet been baptized as the New Testament tells me to be, and as I yet hope to be. But it is dangerous to read the New Testament, expostulated my mother, her voice trembling. Yes, yes. Agreed, my father. More than a hundred years ago, under King Henry the Fourth, after John Wycliffe had been dead many years, the clergy came together and made a law that the translation of the text of Holy Scripture out of one tongue into another is a dangerous thing. Therefore, said they, we decree and ordain that no one henceforth do by his own authority, translate any text of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. The clergy said, though, that translations might be read, if they were approved by the bishops or by a council. But no such translations have ever been approved in all these years. It is no new thing that the priests should hate to let us common folk have the Holy Scripture. But we must have it. A man's conscience has a right to be free. My mother was not a woman to oppose her husband, deeply as she had been shocked to find a New Testament in our home. She had too long been accustomed to submission to others in religious matters to rise in defiance now and declare that the dreaded New Testament must be allowed in the house. I could readily see that it would have been a great relief to her to have burned the book. But my father's will was her law, and much as she might grieve, many prayers as she might make to the saints about this matter, she would keep the possession of the book a secret, even though she thought she endangered her soul by not confessing this thing to the priests. My mother would have gone to the stake with my father, but at this time it would have been for love of him, not for love of the New Testament or of the Lord Jesus Christ. I noticed how my mother would shrink after this, every time that my aunt spoke of those who read the New Testament. Such people are very stubborn, I have heard, asserted my aunt one day. But sometimes a good many of them come back to their senses, and recant, and obey the priests again. I remember there was a year a good while ago, when I was a girl, that the folk called the year of the great abjuration, because so many heretics recanted. Perhaps such a year will come again. My mother answered nothing, and I was sure that in her heart she did not believe that my father would ever recant. He had too well counted the cost of defying the priests before he ever told my mother of his change in belief. He would never go back to the priests and friars, no matter what might come to pass. 
after the Sunday, when we first read the New Testament to my mother, my father daily read a little to us at home. It seems to me that a short time after this, as I look back, and yet I know it must have been in the autumn of the next year, that the Bishop of London, Bishop Tunstall, returned from a mission to Cambrai and brought with him all of the New Testaments that he had been able to buy in Antwerp. Bishop Tunstall made a great bonfire of the New Testaments at Cheapside. Of course, this was exciting to the English people, but it was a foolish thing to do, for the money that Bishop Tunstall had paid for the New Testaments went another way from which he would like. The money went to pay for printing a new edition of the New Testament, and thousands of corrected copies were secretly brought into England very soon. But I run on before my story. Do you think, my mother asked my aunt one day, if a person paid the priests a great deal of money, that they would let a heretic alone? My aunt promptly shook her head. No, she answered. Have you forgotten how years ago there was a rich man, Robert Bartlett, who had to lose his farm and his goods, and he was kept a prisoner in the monastery of Ashrig for seven years, with a badge upon his right sleeve? Yes, responded my mother slowly. I remember. But while the priests did all they could against those whom the Romish clergy called heretics— some of the good people across the sea in the Low Countries had a scheme of their own for introducing the New Testament more widely into England. About Christmas time, 1528, this scheme was working beautifully. New Testaments, hidden in loads of corn, an eatable very much needed in England just then, came to our country. A bookseller of Antwerp named John Raymond had printed a fourth edition of the New Testament, more beautiful, my father said, than the former Testaments, for this kind had pictures, and each page was bordered with red lines. The sacks of corn, with New Testaments inside them, passed bravely on. But alas, certain priests and monks, always prying around, discovered that the sacks were not all corn. The priests, forthwith, carried several copies of this New Testament to the Bishop of London. Now, the bookseller, John Raymond, instead of staying home in Antwerp, had come over to England on board one of the ships with 500 copies of his New Testament. And when the Bishop of London heard what the priests had to say, he laid hands on Raymond and threw him into prison. But the bishop could not get many of the pretty, red-lined New Testaments. They went everywhere, and the New Testament was explained in frequent conventicles in the city of London. And the priests were so disgusted that they said, It is sufficient only to enter London to become a heretic. No wonder that in the autumn of 1529, Bishop Tunstall took all the English New Testaments that he had been able to buy in Antwerp and made his great bonfire. A pretty amusement that was for a bishop. But such bonfires would light in men's hearts a fire that would not be put out. My father still read his New Testament. Wonderful words he found there, and much reasoning went on in his mind. One day, when I found him reading, he put his arm about me and read a few words more. And then he said to me, Ah, uh, Editha, I have not done all that the Lord commands me. This word says, Repent and be baptized. I have repented, but I have not been baptized. Not when you were a baby, father? I asked in surprise. Why, I was. Therefore are we buried with him, murmured my father. Jesus went up out of the water. It is not a drop of holy water on one's forehead, but a burial. Neighbor Eld and I used to talk of it often. He made it so plain 
My father stopped. Then he seemed to remember my question. When I was a baby, he repeated, when I was so small that I did not know how to repent. Yes, I was handed to the priest, but the New Testament says repent comes first. That is what neighbor Eld used to say, and it is true enough. And Tyndale, the man who wrote out the New Testament in English, says, The plunging into the water signifieth that we die, and are buried with Christ, and the pulling out again signifieth that we rise again with Christ in a new life. Did I do that when I was a baby, baptized by the priest, Editha? Was my life different after baptism? I had not repented. I was too little to believe. Why should the priest have baptized me? Why should I count that baptism as aught now? I could not answer. I was puzzled by his words. Editha, continued my father gently, has mother said to you that she wished I would not become an Anabaptist? The tears were in his eyes. No, I answered. No, she has not said so to me. For my mother would never have spoken so of my father to me. But I silently remembered that last Ash Wednesday, father had not gone to have any ashes cast upon him. And afterward, my aunt had said something to my mother about my father's absence and my mother had cried. I knew, though she did not say so, that my mother wished my father had been among those people whom the priest absolved, and on whom he afterward cast ashes. My father was becoming a marked man. The End of Chapter 6